Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Alan Bliner. I'm a professor in the Economics Department in the Woodrow Wilson School. And it was very easy to uh, recruit me for this little job because it's both a pleasure and an honor uh, to introduce to you uh, my long-term friend, Marty Grunberg. Marty is the acting chairman of the FDIC, and we all know what the FDIC does, and we all care about the FDIC. The, uh, the word acting, unfortunately, comes from the Senate's propensity to act slower than a snail. Uh, Marty was nominated by President Obama to this job uh, in June 2011. As far as anybody on earth knows, there is no objection to him getting the job, but here we are in November uh, 2011, waiting for the Senate in its wisdom uh, to act. Uh, prior to that, Prior to becoming acting chairman, Marty Grunberg was vice chairman of the FDIC from August 2005 until whatever date it was you became acting uh, chairman, until very... July 8th. Yep. July 8th, very, very recently. Um, prior to the service on the FDIC, uh, Marty Grunberg was for 20 years almost uh, a staff member in the Senate Banking Committee, where you acquire a great deal of expertise in banking uh, matters. Uh, his first post was a staff director of the Bank of the Committee Subcommittee on Internal Finance and Monetary Policy. And then he went on the Banking Committee staff of Senator Paul Sarbanes of the class of 54 that I mentioned that I may not have mentioned that, of course, Marty Grunberg is a member of the class of 1975, and in fact, a graduate of the Woodrow Wilson School, uh, thereby exemplifying what Woodrow Wilson himself had in mind when he talked about Princeton and the nation's service. Marty has been working in the nation's service, and very well, I might add, since 1987. Uh, we are absolutely delighted that he's taken time out of his busy schedule, trudged up here from Washington in the summer of November 2011 <laughs> uh, to talk to us about the FDIC's role in the financial crisis. And I'm not sure if he meant the previous financial crisis or the next one. I suspect it was the previous. But that will be up to you, Marty, and thank you. Alan, uh, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Um, it's always a, a privilege uh, to come back to, uh, to campus and, and, and have the opportunity to participate um, in the activities of the university, and particularly special to me to uh, take part in an event at the, at the Woodrow Wilson School. I have a very uh, great affinity uh, for the program here. I think the, the work the school does in terms of turning out uh, future public, public servants is uh, extraordinarily important from, in my, from my perspective, never, never more so than now. So uh, any chance I get to, to come and, and participate uh, in programs here, I, uh, I really welcome the opportunity. And, if I may return the compliment, it's an honor for me to be introduced by Professor Blinder, who's also pro provided extraordinary public service in addition to his outstanding uh, academic work. And I wanted to also thank Dean Paxson for, for extending the invitation to me. I, I wanted to, uh, to try to do three things uh, this afternoon uh, and then open it up for questions. I wanted to talk a little bit about how we got into the financial crisis of 2008-2009 uh, here in the United States. And then I want to chat a little bit about uh, the aftermath of that crisis and the response, both the legislative response and the Dodd-Frank Dodd -Frank Act that attempted to fill some of the regulatory gaps that were identified by that crisis. And I wanted to talk specifically about the big new responsibility uh, 
that the FDIC has under that legislation, which is the um, responsibility for the resolution of significantly uh, important, systemically important financial institutions, SIFI is the acronym, SIFIs, uh, which is a major new authority and responsibility under the act that really, really did not exist before. And as a, as a threshold issue, if we are to come to grips with what I view as the, the key challenge coming out of the financial crisis, which is how to address the problem of, of too big to fail in our financial system, which I think is the, the preeminent uh, post-crisis issue. And then I'll conclude with just a brief update on where things stand in the financial industry today and just a few comments on, on the outlook. Uh, but let me start, uh, if I may, at the beginning, because it helps to have some, some context for this conversation. You know, when I, I actually joined the board of the FDIC in August of 2005, that's uh, hard for me to believe over six years ago. And when I, when I joined the board, the FDIC had gone through the longest period since World War II without a bank failure. In fact, when I told people back in the summer of 2005 that I was you know, seeking appointment to the FDIC board, you know, friends of mine actually asked, well, why do you want to go to the FDIC? You know, nothing's happening in the banking industry. You won't have anything to do with it. It's true, I, I couldn't make it up. And I said to them, you know, I should be so lucky. I mean, I really was not looking for a financial crisis to make my service on the board interesting. You know, the challenges of financial regulation are quite sufficient from my standpoint in peacetime. I really, I really wasn't looking for, for a crisis to deal with. But as it turned out, my timing, depending on how you look at it, was, was good or bad. Because clearly these last five years, I think, have been the most consequential in the history of the U.S. financial system. You know, people talk about the 30s as perhaps our greatest financial crisis, but I think it's fair to say that our financial system today is a much larger part of our economy than it was back in the 30s, and also far more integrated globally than it was back then. So I think by any measure, uh, the crisis that we dealt with over these past few years, I think was the most severe and challenging uh, in our nation's history. And I will tell you the first inkling I had of what was coming, because remember I started in 05 when things were, were uh, uh, remarkably quiet. And it was really the following year in August of 06 that I got a phone call uh, from a actually someone who's an, an alumnus of the Woodrow Wilson School M, MPA program. His name is, is Martin Eeks. And Martin is the uh, head of an organization called the Center for Responsible Lending in Durham, North Carolina. He's a remarkable fellow. And his center is probably the leading consumer advocacy and research group in the field of financial services. And Martin called me in August of 06 and said, you know, Marty, there's something happening in the subprime mortgage market that you should know about. And what he basically said to me was that there was a new mortgage product that had effectively taken over the majority of the subprime mortgage market. And he said this, this mortgage product, he called it a hybrid arm. The short term for it was 228s or 3 and the 228, the two stands for the first two years of a 30-year term, and the 28 for the rest of the term of a 30-year mortgage, and three and 27 and so forth. And what Martin said to me was that there were thousands of these mortgages being made at an interest rate for the first two years that was relatively low. But after the first two years, 
there was a sharp adjustment of three or four or more percentage points. And he said to me that these mortgages were being underwritten only at the low introductory rate. And that if once those mortgages adjusted upward, those borrowers wouldn't be able to, to pay those mortgages. And he said the big volume of them had been made in 2004, 2005, so they were going to start coming due in 2007. And there would be, he said to me, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of homeowners in the United States who would lose their homes. This was pretty dramatic stuff in August of 06 when you know, things had really not yet evidenced themselves uh, in the mortgage market yet. And the sad truth was that as dramatic as Martin's warnings were, they actually underestimated, significantly underestimated uh, the dimensions of the problem. And the core issue was this. See, all these subprime mortgage lenders making these loans understood, understood that the borrowers wouldn't be able to pay the adjusted rate. The assumption was that when these folks reached the two or three year term, they'd refinance the mortgage. And of course, when you refinance a mortgage, you generate a whole new set of fees, and it was a very good business for these mortgage lenders. But there was an assumption built into that whole strategy. And the assumption was that housing prices in the United States would continue to rise so that people could get the, would be able to, to refinance their homes. And that assumption was based on pretty solid experience, which is that since World War II up through 2006, housing prices in the United States on an annual basis rose every year. There was no year on a 12-month basis that housing prices in the United States did not rise from the end of World War II until 2007. And in 2007, housing prices began to fall. And all the folks that held these mortgages with the two or three year adjustment period were not able to refinance out of their mortgages and were not able to pay. And so what you had was the beginning of the wave of home foreclosures that began in 2007 and sadly and tragically in many ways is continuing today. Over the last five years, nearly 11 million homes in the United States have entered have entered foreclosure. But the extraordinary part of this story is that um, had it just been a mortgage market crisis, it would have been bad enough. It would have been an extraordinary and severe problem for all of those homeowners, for the communities, for the national economy. But what Martin didn't appreciate, as, as astute as he was in terms of the, what was going on in the mortgage markets, there was not a full appreciation of what was happening with the securitization of these mortgages. And that, in retrospect, was really, at least from my perspective, the, the key to this crisis. Because what you had develop in that period was the development of a large private, what's called a private label mortgage-backed securities markets. These were Wall Street firms packaging these subprime mortgages into mortgage-backed securities and selling those securities to investors, large financial institutions, not only in the United States, but around the world. And selling the mortgage-backed securities wasn't enough. They created derivative products off of these mortgage-backed securities called collateralized debt obligations, CDOs. And then they created derivatives off of the derivatives, which they called CDOs squared. 
And then to manage the risk of the derivatives, they used other derivative products called credit default swaps. So what you had really was a uh, house of cards built up. And at the foundation, at the foundation were these thousands of subprime mortgages that were atrociously underwritten. In the standard phrase, were not underwritten based on the borrower's ability to pay. All based on the assumption that as long as housing prices continue to rise, uh, we could sort of keep the bicycle going. You could refinance out of these mortgages and keep, keep generating the income. But it was, the bet was being made that, that housing prices would keep going up. In 2007, uh, they started going down. They continued going down in 2008. Over this period from 2007 to now, there has been a 30, over 30% 30 decline in housing prices. And this whole house of cards involving not just the homeowners who were losing their homes, but some of our largest, most systemically significant financial institutions in the United States and elsewhere had very large exposures uh, to these instruments uh, and the valuation essentially collapsed. And so what you had was the mortgage crisis that began in 2007 really evolve into a full-blown systemic crisis in 2008. And then you saw the first dominoes begin to fall and these were companies that were uh, securitizing these mortgages. You saw Bear Stearns was the first effectively to fail. And, who's, and the, the acquisition of Bear Stearns was facilitated uh, by the government. It was acquired by J.P. Morgan. You then had the failure of Lehman Brothers, which was allowed to fail, which had, in retrospect, catastrophic consequences that I'll come back to in a moment. And you then saw our largest insurance company, AIG, which had a derivatives operation in London that effectively caused the failure of that company. And you really then had a prospect of cascading failures in the financial system. And uh, the regulators had been trying to deal with these companies on a case-by-case -case basis. And the realization developed that that really was not sufficient. And so there was uh, an effort to develop really an unprecedented uh, systemic response. Uh, it was really a combination of the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC uh, to provide a floor of public support for our largest systemically important financial institutions. The Congress authorized a program called the um, Troubled Asset uh, Relief Program, TARP is the acronym. As it turned out, it was never used for its initial original purpose, which was to buy troubled assets off the books of these institutions. The program was really modified uh, to provide capital grants to strengthen the capital positions of our largest institutions. Uh, the FDIC, pursuant to an emergency authority under the law, uh, provided a guarantee on the unsecured debt of all the insured financial institutions in the United States. I was on the board when we voted for that program. I was working for the Senate committee, as Alan mentioned, when we did the legislation that provide, provided that emergency authority. I can tell you it was, an, it was an authority that was not contemplated, I think, when the law was enacted, but it, it ended up being utilized that way, and I, I will say in retrospect, to great effect. And then, of course, the Federal Reserve developed a whole series of credit market programs, to, essentially to purchase assets off the books, principally of our largest institutions, to provide liquidity for them. It was. A, in, in the end, several trillion dollars of public support 
that was essentially used to prevent a meltdown, uh, a catastrophic meltdown of our financial system. And even with, even with all of that support, in the early part of 2009, I think it's fair to say there was genuine uncertainty as to whether the system would hold together. Uh, the regulatory agencies led by the Fed um, undertook a stress test of our 19 largest institutions. Um, about half of the institutions determined whether they had adequate capital, well, about half uh, were determined to need additional capital, and about half were deemed to have sufficient capital. And the markets, the, the results of those stress tests were made public to the financial markets, so they were able to review their credibility. And the markets, fortunately, and I can tell you there was nothing, there was no sure thing about this, the markets deemed the tests credible and sort of accepted uh, the evaluations of the institutions. And over the second half, of 2009, the financial markets finally began to, to loosen up. And um, by the beginning of 2010, uh, there was a sense that we were beginning to step away from the precipice and some, some return to normalcy for our, our largest um, financial institutions. And then in response to all of this, in response to all of this, of course, the, the Congress undertook an effort to develop legislation uh, to deal with what, in retrospect, were clear limitations on the authorities of our regulatory agencies uh, to deal with systemic risk, systemic financial risk in the United States. And let me tick off what I would identify as the four regulatory gaps that existed uh, prior to the enactment of the new legislation. Um, and these gaps, I think, both limited the ability of the regulators to identify the risks developing prior to the crisis and really constrained the ability of the regulatory agencies to respond to the crisis once it developed. And these, the four gaps are as follows. One, you know, we have, we had and we have a series of regulators, the Fed, the FDIC, the OCC, the SEC, the CFTC, uh, each of which has responsibilities for a segment of our financial system. But we had no institution, no entity responsible for looking at the system across the board, at bank and non-bank financial companies uh, uh, to identify systemic risk as opposed to risk that may exist in, a, in an individual institution. Under the new legislation, a Financial Stability Oversight Council was created. It's made up of all the federal financial regulators. And that council has the explicit responsibility to identify risk across the system. There are people who've criticized the council because it's difficult to get multiple agencies to cooperate and work together. But at least today, we have an institution uh, responsible for identifying risk across the system. Second, when you think back to 2008, the first three institutions that, that collapsed, the first three dominoes were Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, and AIG, two investment banks and our largest insurance company. In other words, none of them None of them were insured financial institutions or bank holding companies. And under our previous system, 
none of those institutions were subject to any meaningful prudential regulation. They were subject to certain market regulation, but in terms of safety and soundness, in terms of routine prudential examination and enforcement, they were, subject, they were essentially exempt from any meaningful prudential regulation. So that when those companies got into difficulty, not only was there a lack of authority to examine them, but we didn't even, we being the regulators, weren't even clear on the exposures those institutions, those institutions had or their condition. And in addition to that, when Lehman Brothers failed in 2008, the only recourse, the only recourse, uh, the only statutory recourse that we had in the United States uh, was the bankruptcy courts. And the bankruptcy courts are not set up to manage an orderly dissolution of a large, complex, systemically important financial company. And that became very apparent in the Lehman Brothers, uh, in the Lehman Brothers failure, which in retrospect uh, severely exacerbated uh, the depth of the financial crisis. Well, under the new legislation, this new Financial Stability Oversight Council has authority to designate any financial company, whether bank or non-bank, as a systemically important financial institution. And once designated, th that company is subject to the full prudential regulatory authorities of the Federal Reserve, including capital requirements, liquidity requirements, leverage limitations, concentration limits, and the rest. These are authorities that did not exist prior to the legislation. And in addition, the Federal Reserve was given what are called enhanced prudential supervision authorities over all uh, uh, bank holding companies with assets over $50 billion in the United States. So it now has the authority to impose prudential standards on these systemically important companies that go beyond the standards imposed on, on the rest of the industry. And in addition, the new legislation creates for the first time a public resolution authority um, to place any financial company, whether bank or non-bank, and its holding company and affiliates into a public resolution process. That authority did not exist uh, prior to 2010. And for better or worse, the, under the new law, the FDIC has the lead responsibility uh, for carrying out that authority. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute because it's, it's clearly the, the critical responsibility, that new responsibility that the FDIC has uh, under the legislation. And then, um, so that's identifying systemic risk, enhanced prudential supervision of all systemic financial companies, systemic resolution authority, and then finally, over-the-counter derivatives, which in retrospect were crucial, crucial to the um, uh, transferring the systemic risk uh, to financial institutions in the United States and globally. And in the United States, over-the-counter derivatives were exempt, were exempt from regulation um, prior to the, to the legislation. So that uh, when these companies got into difficulty, we literally uh, not only had a lack of authority to regulate them, but no understanding of what, of what these exposures were. So in retrospect, it's pretty clear that the lack of these authorities, one, left us uh, poorly equipped to identify these risks as they developed and really constrained our ability, us being the 
federal financial regulators to respond to the crisis uh, once it developed. And now let me turn to this systemic resolution issue because it's the big ticket item for the FDIC. It's among the many things that keep me up at night, this is probably the one that is, 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 is most responsible. Um, and it's really an enormous challenge. If, if we thought we had a too big to fail problem in the United States prior to this crisis, uh, and we thought there was, an, uh, there was a belief in financial markets that there was implicit public support for large financial institutions that might have a systemic consequence. I think it's fair to say that in the aftermath of this crisis, what had been implicit has been made explicit. We provided extraordinary public support to a universe of essentially 15 to 20 large financial companies that uh, clearly in the eyes of the market, uh, uh, there's now a reasonable basis to believe that these companies are, are deemed too big to fail. And the consequence of that is the markets believe that at the end of the day, the government will come in and support these institutions. That allows them a funding advantage in the market when they seek to borrow. And that funding advantage allows them to assume risk that they would not otherwise be able to assume. So if anything exacerbates their systemic consequence and gives them a competitive advantage in the financial marketplace in regard to the other financial institutions that, that, don't, that don't benefit from that, from that market perception. It, it is really uh, a, a fundamental distortion uh, in the operation of our financial markets that exacerbates systemic risk and creates an unlevel, an unlevel playing field. And in, in effect, in many ways, is the price we paid for our response to this crisis. I think in retrospect, I wouldn't second guess what was done in 2008 and 2009. However difficult things seem to be today, if we had had a full-scale financial meltdown, I think both the financial system and the economy would be in far worse shape today um, than it is. So I, I think, um, you know, I wouldn't second guess those judgments, but I think it's fair to say uh, we paid a significant price for them, which is the perception that we have in our financial markets today that there are, in effect, uh, privileged institutions. And uh, under the new legislation, the, at least two keys for beginning to address that is, one, the enhanced prudential standards that will impose higher uh, regulatory requirements in terms of capital and liquidity on these institutions in some measure in recognition of the systemic risks they pose. And in addition, uh, we have to be able to demonstrate that if one of these companies uh, mismanages itself, and as a result of its decisions, gets into difficulty, uh, it has to suffer uh, the, uh, the verdict of the marketplace and be subject to a market discipline of, of being allowed to fail without thereby causing the system as a whole to be placed in jeopardy. And developing that capacity to place one of these large, complex, uh, systemically significant financial institutions. The largest of them, in addition, have extensive international operations only complicating the, the challenge of, of, of managing their resolution without systemic disruption. The, the ability uh, to subject these companies to meaningful market discipline, I would argue, is really one of the great challenges we have uh, coming out of this financial crisis. And, that has been at the top of the FDIC's uh, 
list of priorities since the enactment of the legislation that was signed into law in July of, July of last year. So let me, if I may, spend uh, a couple of minutes talking about what the FDIC is doing to try to carry out those responsibilities, and then I'll conclude just with a brief comment on, on the condition of the industry today and, and a, a little bit on the outlook. Um, pursuant to its new authorities, the FDIC has established a new office. It's called the Office of Complex Financial Institutions. And this office has three groups within it. The first group is made up of examiners responsible for monitoring the condition of our large systemic financial institutions from the standpoint of resolution, not simply prudential safety and soundness regulation, but the resolution and winding up of the companies. There is a second group that's responsible for the developing the resolution plans for the closure of these companies. I will tell you, since the enactment of the law in August of last year, the FDIC has been working on a set of internal resolution plans for each of our largest systemically significant companies. And those plans are in actually a, a relatively advanced state of development. In addition, under the new law, uh, each of these companies will be required to develop its own resolution plan that it will have to submit to the regulators. And under the law, the Federal Reserve and the FDIC have joint responsibility for the development of those company plans. Uh, we, both the Fed and the FDIC, have issued the final regulation, final joint regulation, for the implementation of those plans. And we're now in the process of engaging with our largest companies, and for the very largest, those with assets over 250 billion, those plans will have to be completed and approved by July, by July of next year. But I would point out that those plans are really a complement to the internal planning process that the FDIC has been engaged in for the past year. And those company plans will really serve as a complement uh, to the internal plans that, that we've been working on for a while. And then finally, there's a, a third group in this new office responsible for the cross-border issues uh, relating to these companies. That group is responsible for engaging with the foreign supervisors of the foreign operations of these companies. And getting cross-border cooperation uh, is really going to be critical if we're going to manage an orderly resolution of these institutions. And if there's one uh, thing that people seem to have learned from this crisis of the past two or three years, uh, foreign supervisors are acutely aware of the cross-border risks that these institutions pose. And there's uh, been actually uh, a lot of international activity among uh, financial regulators uh, in regard to the resolution of these uh, large systemic financial companies. And in, uh, we will be, we being the FDIC and the Fed, will be and have been engaging with the key foreign supervisors of the large foreign operations of these companies. Um, and we, we we're actually hopeful that we can uh, develop an effective working relationship. But clearly, uh, this is a major operational challenge for us. And there really isn't a precedent for this sort of undertaking. In the course of this past crisis, the largest insured institution to fail was, was Washington Mutual which at the time was our largest thrift institution, our largest savings and loan, uh, and our sixth largest insured financial institution in the United States. It had assets of about $300 billion. And the FDIC, uh, Washington Mutual failed. The FDIC placed it into receivership. And then we immediately sold Washington Mutual at no cost to the deposit insurance fund. But that was the largest failure in US history. 
And the truth is that Washington Mutual, relative to our largest financial companies today, and I won't name names, but you all know who they are, uh, is relatively small, uh, relatively simple, and that it was principally engaged in mortgage lending and had no international operations of any kind. So compared to the challenges posed by our largest financial companies, uh, Washington Mutual was, was relatively simple. And let me tell you, it was plenty st stressful trying to manage the resolution of that company. So trying to deal with truly the mega companies um, is a very large challenge, but I, I think really one of the crucial ones uh, if, if we're going, uh, going to come to terms uh, with the market risk posed by these, these very large very large financial companies. So, so where are we today? And I'll close on this. Um, well, better off than we were in 2008 and 2009. Uh, the capital of our largest institutions, capital and liquidity, is much stronger today. And that strength in capital and liquidity actually goes through the, the whole banking system. The regulators have been working pretty aggressively to put the industry in a, in a stronger place today than it, uh, than it was two, two or three years ago. Uh, earnings income for the industry has actually been steady and increasing over the last several quarters. The FDIC releases each quarter what we call the quarterly banking profile. We release the earnings of our insured financial institutions. We just released those the earnings for the third quarter last week. Uh, the industry in, as a whole had net income of $35 billion. That was up from $25 billion in the, $24 billion, I guess, in the quarter before. Um, credit quality has been improving in terms of reduced delinquencies on loans, reduced charge-offs on loans. There was even a sm small growth in outstanding loan balances. Um, and the indications most specific to the FDIC have been improving. We, we keep what's called a problem bank list, which is the list of all, we have a rating system of banks of one to five, with four and five being the lowest rated institutions. And we keep a list of the institutions that are four and five rated. And that list had been growing steadily for a five year period until the second quarter of this year, when for the first time in five years, that problem bank list actually declined. And then in the third quarter, numbers which we released last week, uh, the problem bank list declined again. It's still at very high levels, over, over 800 institutions, um, but it is a, a positive direction. Um, bank failures are down this year. Uh, thus far, 90 institutions have failed. Uh, and uh, at this time last year, 149 had failed. Uh, last year, a total of 157 banks failed. We expect by the end of this year, there will be, it'll, that number will be less than 100. And our projections for next year are, are lower still. Uh, and the deposit insurance fund, which we obviously pay a lot of attention to, um, went into negative balance as a result of all the bank failures. The deposit insurance fund was as much as $20 billion in the red during the course of this crisis. As of June 30th of this year, the deposit insurance fund, for the first time in several years, moved into positive territory and increased again in the third quarter. So the, you know, the, the, the general indicators for the industry are, are positive. I will tell you, earlier this year, we were, let us say, cautiously optimistic that we were really on a path uh, of working our way through this whole episode. And you know, those are still our projections, but I think it's fair to say there's uh, greater uncertainty today than there was six months ago. We had been, it looked for a while like the economy really might be heading for a downturn. Uh, 
I mean, interestingly, the most recent economic numbers have been more positive. So that, that path is, is uh, uh, perhaps a little more hopeful. But I think the big question mark, and it's on the front page of every newspaper, uh, really are the, are the developments in Europe where, you know, as you know, there are, there are a profound set of, of institutional problems and an interlocking set of problems relating to sovereign debt of European countries and bank exposure to that sovereign debt that play off of one another and uh, is creating an, an extraordinarily, extraordinarily difficult challenge which is only complicated by the institutional arrangement in the European Union where you have you know, 17 countries whose cooperation has to, has to be gained. And um, uh, the European situation poses two obvious risks. One, it's slowing down the European economy, which would have consequences for US economic growth. And a, a, a development of a real financial crisis in Europe uh, would have uh, significant consequences potentially for, for our financial system with knock-on economic effects as well. So that, that really creates an element of uncertainty that I think is, is the big issue, the big issue going forward. Why don't I, I stop there? And I'd be glad to try to answer questions you may have on the financial crisis, the European situation, or anything else that's on your mind. And, and thank, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. The slide. Thank you. We do have time for questions. There are mics on each of the aisle. So if you, if you have, like to ask a question, please come down to the mic. Uh, the tradition is to give preference to students. Uh, so go right ahead. Start right here. Hi. Thanks so much for coming today. Um, I have a question about the temporary liquidity guarantee program, which you sort of alluded to. Um, the FDIC is taking extraordinary action to guarantee uh, bank debt during the crisis. Um, so a lot of the reports indicate that the FDIC's culture sort of being a traditionally sort of insurance function made it reluctant to take on that risk during the crisis. And as you briefly mentioned, the interpretation of the law was at least novel, if, if not awkward. Um, so, uh, and, and yet it was certainly very effective, the action taken by, by, all, by all accounts. So. I'm wondering if you think the FDIC's culture is going to have to change in the coming years to deal with its centrality in dealing with all these complicated systemic risks under the Dodd-Frank regime, um, or whether its traditional sort of insurance fund culture is going to serve it well going forward. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, the, the FDIC by uh, instinct and experience is a conservative regulator. And I think that instinct served as well in the crisis, if I may say. Uh, and I, I do think the FDIC comes out of this crisis um, a different agency than, than it entered the crisis with. That arguably is true of all the regulators. But clearly, we were called upon to do things that were, uh, were unprecedented in terms of uh, stabilizing the financial system. And the new responsibilities we have uh, for the resolution of systemic financial companies uh, gives us a direct responsibility for systemic. We're, we're, we're also members of the new Financial Stability Oversight Council that I mentioned. But as the lead agency responsible for uh, systemic resolution, and that those authorities go to the holding company as well as the insured institution and all of the affiliates, uh, that responsibility um, places us uh, very much at the center of efforts to, to strengthen our capacity to deal with systemic risk. So I do think the mandate of the FDIC has, has been broadened um, as a result of the crisis. And I think in retrospect, uh, the agency uh, responded 
responded well during the course of the crisis. The, it has a history. There were three great crises in the history of the, FD, of the FDIC. The first was the collapse of the banking system in the 30s, which really brought the FDIC into existence. There was no deposit insurance. The president declared a banking holiday when he took office. Uh, the challenge was restoring public, the public's confidence in the banking system. And they, uh, in, in uh, June of 33, as part of the Banking Act that was passed, for the first time in the United States or anyone else, uh, they took the radical step of establishing a national system of deposit insurance in the United States. It had never existed before. And it very quickly uh, it, uh, helped to restore the public's confidence in the banking system and, and got people willing to put their money back in rather than, than under their mattress. And then in the late 80s, um, we had the, uh, uh, the savings and loan crisis in the United States. You students probably don't remember that, but some of the other folks here may. And that crisis also resulted in a significant expansion of the FDIC's responsibilities. And then clearly this crisis um, had a further transformative effect in it. And, um, you know, I, it's an agency with a lot of capability, and that's sort of been my experience, that was built up principally by the, um, the historic experience of the agency in responding to crises. When we were confronted with the events of 2008 and 2009, we had a core of senior executives that had been through the SNL crisis of the 80s and 90s. I mean, the, when I joined the board, before all the, the crisis hit, the old timers would come back and tell me, Oh, you should have been here during the good old days. You know, we were closing five, ten banks a week. It was terrific. <laughs> and I said, it's okay, but I've now been around when we were closing five or ten banks a, a week. And we were very fortunate to have people at the FDIC this time around who had been through the crisis of the 80s and the 90s, as well as the managing the aftermath of the disposition of the billions of dollars of assets for those failed institutions. And that really equipped as well both to respond during the crisis and I think uh, to carry out the new responsibilities we have under the law. Yes. Chairman Grunberg, in the recent years, uh, institutions such as long-term capital management and MF Global have blindsided market participants and regulators. Um, in the upcoming stress tests and review of financial institutions in general, how will holdings of European sovereign debt be taken into account since that's the specter now overhanging uh, every financial institution? Well, I, I'm sure it won't surprise you that that's been a subject of a lot of attention uh, by both the regulators and, and the institutions. I think um, and you raise a, an important point. Um, I think the key concern um, our, our large institutions do have exposures to European financial institutions and, and sovereigns. Um, but I, I think the, perhaps the greatest concern is not so much the direct exposures, uh, but to the potential indirect market consequences of a financial crisis in Europe generating the kind of contagion effect that we saw in our financial markets in 2008, where you literally had a, had a freezing up of uh, the willingness of financial markets to fund our largest financial institutions. And that, that has probably been our, uh, our, our greatest focus. But, that, but I, I, I mean, that is, that is perhaps the key issue going forward. MF Global being regulated by any particular part of the apparatus in Washington? Yes, no, the MF Global is, is subject to regulation by the CFTC, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, uh, and the SEC. Uh, we were fortunate in the case of MF Global. No one thought it was of a scale uh, sufficient to present systemic issues, but I, I think it's fair to say it's, 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 it's a warning. And, um, something we're, we're paying close attention to. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon. Um, sitting where you're sitting now, would you give us your thoughts on the repeal of Glass-Steagall and what <laughs> you think the 
potential value of Volcker rule might be and how much um, easier or not it might be for the regulators um, going forward from here where we are now. Yeah, I think on, you know, on Glass-Steagall, uh, to a certain extent, uh, that's water under the bridge. I mean, the, in fact, at a regulatory level, the, um, the mixing of uh, investment banking and commercial banking, as you know, even preceded uh, the uh, passage of the Graham Leach Bliley Act, which repealed Glass Steagall. So, um, uh, and and I think it's fair to say, you know, that there were consequences. So I wouldn't deny that there were consequences, but I don't think at this stage, you know, there's there's um, uh, there's a, you're going to go back to to reevaluate that. I think the the vocal rule is, and you raise it appropriately, isn't some measure uh, in effort to, to deal with some of those issues, to try to separate out proprietary trading by these large financial companies, which can carry significant risk with it. Uh, as you know, the regulatory agencies have issued a proposed rule uh, to implement the so-called Volcker Rule, and we're uh, getting public comment on that now. And it's, it's a, going to be a challenging rule to implement, but, but uh, we are in the midst of that process. Thank you. Okay. Um, given the political unpopularity of TARP, do you think that your guarantee is as explicit as you mentioned before? Well, that's a good question. We, we would, uh, that's a very good question. Um, we have tried to, and with some success actually, indicated to the credit rating agencies that to the extent they give large financial institutions um, an enhanced rating because they believe the institutions uh, benefit from implicit public support, and we have actually indicated to the credit rating agencies that under the authorities of the new legislation, uh, the potential for public support for an open institution, for an open institution as opposed to a closed institution, uh, is actually sharply constrained uh, post Dodd-Frank. And I think that's subjectively true and has actually been recognized uh, by, um, by one of the credit rating agencies. So I, I think that's an important point. And frankly, it's our goal in terms of the implementation of both the Systemic Resolution Authority and the Enhanced Prudential Standards uh, to diminish as much as we can uh, any in, in, uh, benefit that these large companies may be perceived as having in regard to public support. Hi. Um, is there anything that the FDIC or any other government um, institutions can do to reduce the impact of a potential um, I guess, uh, recession in the European Union or um, a fallout? <laughs> well, not if you're talking about it within the economy of Europe, other than having our Treasury Secretary and Federal Reserve Chairman talk with the relevant officials there about uh, strategies for, for responding to the crisis. I mean, it's not, you know, the, that it's really under, under those authorities. Uh, do we spend a good deal of time thinking about the potential consequences for the U.S. economy and financial system of uh, recession in Europe or financial difficulties in Europe? The, an the answer to that is yes. What about, um, I guess, like the, imp I guess, like the, re the repercussions that it would have on the U.S. financial markets? Like, is there anything that we can do? I mean, I guess, like the FDIC can do to mitigate that impact. Well, we, we, it's, it's one of the reasons um, the uh, agencies have been, over the past two or three years, pressing our financial companies to strengthen their capital and liquidity positions, uh, to give them more of a cushion uh, to, to withstand um, pressures that may develop in, in the event uh, of another crisis. And, and frankly, it's one of the reasons that um, 
we've been working so intensively on these resolution plans that if we have large financial companies or a large financial company that, that gets into difficulty, we want to have the capacity uh, to, to manage an orderly resolution of that company without putting the system as a whole at risk. So those are things we've been, been working on pretty hard. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for your uh, comments and the uh, historical uh, analysis of the financial crisis. Um, my question, from your comments, it sounds like the uh, mortgage industry is very critical to what happened in the financial crisis. And for years in the mortgage industry, um, it, it worked soundly because mortgage lenders required a high deposit and also they kept the loans on their own books. And that worked very well to keep that industry very sound for many, many years. But sometime, somehow that changed over time. And was some law changed to make that shift? Or was that just creative financing by some mortgage lenders? Or if we went back to that type of setup, that would be very sound. And I understand in Canada, that's the way they operated. And they still did. And they were not so strongly affected by the financial crisis. So is there any interest in going back to that setup or any laws that were changed or how, what happened there? Well, you'll, you'll get a lot of different opinions on that subject, by the way. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my two cents, which is um, I do think uh, we for years had the 30 year fixed rate mortgage that really did us pretty well from the 30s to the 90s, and then even with the development of adjustable rate mortgages, pretty straightforward. I, I, I do think the late 90s, early part of the past decade, 2000, uh, you really had uh, a couple of developments. You had, um, and I sort of alluded to that, you, you had the development of uh, more complex mortgage products designed with the ostensible intent of expanding the capability of people to qualify for mortgages. Um, but I think the fact was that um, the complexity was designed in some sense to manage risk. I think the reality of it was that the complexity ended up uh, hiding risk in the underwriting of these mortgages. And then a crucial, I think, was the uh, development of the uh, Wall Street-driven private label mortgage securities markets, apart from the government-sponsored enterprises, which were uh, not at the time, in the late 90s, early part of 2000s, uh, 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 securitizing these new products, really key to the rapid growth of the subprime mortgage products that I mentioned. And then there was a, a, above the subprime segment of the market. The subprime, by definition, are borrowers who have impaired credit history. So they were the highest risk. But there was a segment of the mortgage market above subprime called Alt-A, uh, where you had the development of, uh, so, and I won't even try to start describing their terms these option arm products with negative amortization features, if you understand it, um, that people did not really understand, I think, or many people used them to get into homes they couldn't afford. And then you had the securitization of those poorly underwritten mortgages uh, by the uh, Wall Street firms and the use of derivative products to further uh, transmit the risk. And, 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 and we got what we got into. And you know, what do we do now? Well, the mortgage-backed securities market right now is, um, except for the uh, GSEs and FHA, the private label market is, is really not functioning. And um, uh, there's a real question as to whether it will come back and, and how. And there are provisions in the new legislation that will uh, try to address uh, the underwriting problems and the poor incentives that were built into that whole securitization process. But that's a, a, a long answer to we got ourselves into a, into a real mess. 
Was some law changed to allow mortgage lenders to not to allow them to sell their mortgages uh, to the Wall Street? No, no, that, that was available, at least to my knowledge, there was no statutory change. That, it, that was a, it was, was, you know, it, was, it was creative finance. I don't know how else to put it, that uh, developed the products and developed the, both the, the mortgage products and then the securities products and then the derivatives products. That, at least from, from my standpoint, helped to enable this whole thing. Good afternoon, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question about what you would do when you examine an institution that's economically insolvent, but because of the way they account for certain assets are not actually deemed insolvent by the market. Now what I have in mind here is, you know, the accounting uh, held to maturity versus held for sale treatment. So let's say you own Greek bonds and you put it in your health to maturity account, you get to account for it at 21 cent discount, whereas economically it's really maybe worth 30 cents. And if it was really worth 30 cents, the institution would be insolvent. How would you deal with that? Would the public actually know? Yeah, no, it's, it it's, an, important, it's an important question. Um, I don't want to get overly technical, because one, I'll quickly get over my head, and two, I'll certainly bore you all, but um, let me say that's been the subject of a lot of attention. And you pointed to the trading book versus the uh, book of loans held to maturity and uh, trading book assets, which were definition are supposed to be held short term for trading purposes, historically have been subject to lower capital requirements than loans that are held on the book to maturity. And during the course of this crisis, one of the games played was to put a lot of assets that maybe should have been or not should have been in the trading book, weren't really in the trading book, but were put in the trading book for the advantageous capital treatment. And that whole issue, I will tell you, has been the subject of a, uh, not only a attention in the United States, it's been an international issue. And it's one of the agreements that have come out of the Basel Committee uh, to increase capital requirements for assets held in the trading book. But my question really is, what would happen if you saw an institution yeah. that was economically insolvent, yeah. but, but was not deemed insolvent because of the way they account for these assets? Well, you, you know, you're raising a question about the validity of accounting practices. And I think uh, the, the, as a regulatory matter, um, you know, we evaluate the condition of the institution according to accounting principles to assure some uh, uniformity in how these institutions are treated, how assets are treated. Um, and at times, I will grant you, some of these accounting rules uh, don't seem sensible. And I think one of the issues that you identify is this whole trading book matter. And I will tell you that um, the, that, that issue has been the subject now of an international agreement and the U.S. regulatory agencies will soon be coming out with a proposed rulemaking uh, to strengthen the capital requirements of assets in the trading book of, of these financial institutions. Thank you. I'm going to interrupt here. The time is up and we have to get moving. I'm sorry, uh, there were some more questions. Uh, please join me in thanking Marty Grunberg.